Namibia has some deserts and some forests, it also has some land that can be used to grow our own vegetables and fruits. But how to grow those resources with the limited amount of water that we have? Climate smart agriculture is an important component of our nationally determined contributions. Climate smart agriculture can help us address poverty and create jobs while contributing to safeguarding our environment and in particular safeguarding our most precious commodity which is water. We all know that some years we are blessed with very good rains while others we barely receive anything. Climate change affecting climate patterns. We should develop an agriculture that is adapted to our local conditions. As we know, Namibia has adopted new nationally determined contributions. One of its four pillars is called AFOLU, which stands for Agriculture, Forestry and Other Land Use. Today, we will focus particularly on agriculture and other land use. The first show, from January to the end of March, we have planned the winter. From August, August month to uh, November, we have planned the summer. So now we are going to start the winter, we are going to start the summer. So now we are going to start the summer, but we are going to start the summer, but we are going to start the summer. We are going to February or March, but we are going to start the summer until the end of the year. But we are going to start the summer. We are going to start January to March, but we are going to start the summer. But we are going to start the year. We are going to start the year. Celery. Yeah, celery. You can you chop any cost. You can any fresh insect or you can any uh, source insect. Hmm. You can eat. <laughs> raw? Yeah, you can, you can raw eat. <laughs> <Make true. laughs> it's a big better, yeah. <laughs> better. <laughs> yeah, it's better, yeah. But the two have plant, um, that as the end, as the end, no, you start to do it, that play in Yeah, so I'm going to for the end, the end, the plant. And the NSM net om dat gaat makkelijk te als je ene vrienden daar moet daar moet daar moet daar moet ene wees. Today here we are talking about the JPP Farmers Club, where we are basically work with farmers in the communities. But today we are in Mayana, where we are going to look what we have implemented as an NGO, help going hand in hand with the community when it comes to development. So uh, this one now, for the moment, we are calling it it's a, demonst a demonstration project, whereby uh, the aim uh, and the main objective is to capacitate the farmers, actually the people, the community members, those who want to learn on how to farm with horticulture. The APP are trying to capacitate uh, elderly women, uh, young mothers, some men who are willing to stand on their own when it comes to food production. It is not easy uh, to make people to move from their old style to get new style. But since there is a proven story, as you can see, yes, uh, we are expecting and knowing that we, we, we will change the mind of the people. Uh, we will set their mind according to the climate change, and I am sure they will adapt it. What we want is uh, the level of farming nowadays has changed due to global warming and, and, and climate change. But as you can see, that what we have implemented here is about producing vegetables on a household level. So the bigger goal is that uh, we, we want these farmers to be called the graduates. When we are talking about graduates, we are aiming that each and every farmer who is being trained, they have to have their own one hectare plot so that these skills, then they can take it there. Then these ones, we are talking now moving to the level of commercial. Then they can produce enough for their households and the surplus they can sell, they can pay their children's education, they can pay their health, and many more that they want. So the water is, we put it in the, in the uh, raw water dam, and then from that dam, you see this machine. This machine is a reverse osmosis plant. So this machine cleans up our water, because the plants 
um, need clean water and we add, because we use a um, hydroponic system, we add food to the water and then it's, that's why it's very important for the water to be clean. All right, that's why we use this machine. As you can see, we are not finished yet. We are still installing another machine so that we can clean all our water that we need. This is the, the place where the food of the plants is mixed. You can see this, uh, it's a strange color. So this is the food for the water, all right? And it's being mixed um, with the water and then it's being pumped to the, to the plants. Hydroponic, it's basically when you are planting your plants, mm -hmm. not in the soil itself. Yes. When you are using different media, but except the soil. We don't grow in the soil. Yes. We grow in cocoa pit. Mm -hmm. The cocoa pit is all the way from, all the way from India. And then cocoa we, pit? Yeah, cocoa pit. It's all the, the outside coconut oh. that was just sucked. Mm. Yeah. Hydroponic technology, it's actually easier to, to, to maintain. Mm -hmm. Easier to, to see, to, to control different climate weather change. Mm -hmm. So that's actually the main, the main, the main advantage of using hydroponic. Yeah, from the start it was actually a bit of struggle since we had the coast and then we had different types of weather. Mm -hmm. But along the way we managed to, to, to adjust, or we, we managed to experience what actually is needed in this weather. Means that you. Yeah, you have fish, you have a water cycle and you grow your vegetables in that water. So you're not losing any water. And yeah, if I show you later on, you will see what is aquaponics because it's growing vegetables with fish food. Ah, it's a symbiotic living system, mm -hmm. ecosystem, which is a natural ecosystem where the plants and the fish are in a a symbiotic living way that they contribute to. They correspond. Yeah. Okay. Water flows from the heart pump through this tank where the fish are in here. Fish is in here. Stand there, you The fish poo is circulating in the water. It basically dissolves. All the necessary nutrients dissolve into that. Uh, tank next to the green one. Mm -hmm. The water runs from here into this filter mm -hmm. and from here the water is going on its own and you have to set the, the, your, your taps uh, basically on a sequence mm -hmm. to a desired level so that the water can not overflow but will uh, end up in the siphon, the siphon will release then the water is going on its own and you have to set up the tapes on a sequence at the desired level. You want to give the right quantity to the plants. The plants take the nutrients they need and the water is then drained between the stones back to the fish tank. Because the pool is nutrients mm -hmm. that go through the beds and the plants taking that up and the rest flows back into the sump tank and then back into the tank, so it's a cycle. With our key performance areas actually include a wide range of, of areas. Uh, as I've said, in agriculture, for instance, we've got a pilot project. Like this year is the first year since I've started this project that we have frost here. And that caught us totally off guard, not only outside, but you'll see in the tunnels as well, uh, we had that uh, frost damage. In 1956, this was the biggest hydroponic section in the southern atmosphere. So it shows you the potential in Oranjemund for this type of things. The people, the old people started those years already. It's just another point that we're proving that agriculture is one of your major players in this Karas region of Alps. Now the intent of the, the pilot project is to do a bit of research and development. The way these systems were designed, so as you water the plants, the water runs out and it went to an underground sump 
And that water was recycled back into the garden. But today's times, you cannot do it. One virus from one plant and you infect your whole area. Tomatoes have been very successful over the last couple of years in the tunnel here. Uh, it's the first time now that we're trying it in the net house to see what it's do different varieties all together. To see what crops will uh, be successful in the type of soils and in the type of environment that we've got. I think that's important one. What we are doing here is we have agriculture as a subject at school and we are doing all the practicals here at the garden. So we are trying to teach our children about sustainability and um, all the project, all the practicals of the projects are done here at the, at the garden. So you will see here we have the greenhouse here where we plant tomatoes, um, cucumbers and others. We also do little experiments here with the kids. And then we have the outside area where they also experiment in you know, planting onions, tomato, uh, carrots and tomatoes on the inside, on the outside to see the difference and also to determine what is the best way to grow it. So what we are trying to do is, besides doing the practicals of the subject, we are also trying to get children to, to learn the soft skills that goes with it and also sustain our school kitchen where the feeding scheme is running from, uh, from the garden. Your carrots, beetroots, the onions, um, your garlics, we found um, is withstanding the, the, the wind and sand better than your other plants. But yeah, you can see the on this stage in time, these tomatoes should have been this height already. But the cold just kept everything, everything was kept back by the cold. It's very important and looking at the location of Orangi Munt, you know where we are, in the middle of the desert. We have the desert, the ocean, the river. It's important that children understand, you know, the different uh, ecosystems that they find themselves in and how to make good use of that in order to provide food, you know, to, to, secure, to secure food for the country, for themselves and through that for, for the country. So it goes with food security and like I'm saying, the soft skills that they acquire in, in working here at the garden. Like today is Monday, so it's different grades coming every day. On a Monday, the grade fives, on the Tuesday, grade six class, Wednesday, grade sevens. And when they come here, they know exactly what to do. And uh, we're also trying to make it interesting for them so that they also have the freedom to explore and to experiment. With the changing weather systems and things like that, for some reason, uh, the past year, the whole of Namibia battled with white fly. We battled with tuta. The weather conditions has also changed and, and, and that's what's caught it a lot of people off guard on this stage. Uh, we're not supposed to have frost in this area. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is becoming a problem and we'll have to adapt to these systems. Agriculture normally provides quite a number of jobs and we've got a ratio of three um, uh, people employed per hectare which means we can, at least from the land, have 1,500 additional jobs. So at a small scale, we can be smart by monitoring our gardens and using water from rivers or recycled water. At a larger scale, we can use hydroponic techniques, planting without using swell, or even aquaponic techniques, developing integrated biosystems benefiting one another. Our NDC has a component called EFLO, which stands for agriculture, forestry, and other land use. Other land use is particularly important for cities as we are moving towards green cities. Okay, so at the moment we have a lot of different projects that are running from the different um, divisions. Um, anything whereby we are trying to use, of course, technology mm -hmm. uh, to make our city more friendly, to make our city more sustainable. Um, of course, with our focus is just to make sure that um, the future generation that is going to come after us in the city of Ventuk, there will still be resources for them to use so that they can also just, you know, sustain themselves. And when you have an environment clean, it's always attractive to, to investors. When they see that the Akhrutondin is clean, they will be more willing to invest in our towns. And also a clean environment, it ensures the health and the safety of, of, of the residents. So for the city of Ventuk, we want to become a smart and caring city of which we want to, um, 
to use ICT mainly, uh, to have ICT at the core of our focus, to use that and uh, make sure that we meet all the needs of our citizens without also compromising our own needs and compromising that of the future generation. First of all, I feel like a place where people feel like a sense of belonging. You come to a town and you feel like this is where I belong, it's clean, and a place where everyone is participating in things that preserve our environment. In about five years' time, the city is hoping to have a well-developed uh, public transport system. Mm -hmm. Also, a clean city that, have, um, that offers now less air pollution, yes. less carbon emission, and people have choices. Now and then, we always have a clean, clean campaign. And part of the clean cleanup campaign is to to create awareness and educate uh, our residents and all our stockholders on why is it necessary to have a clean road fountain. It's very important to keep our environment um, clean, like so because like what happens is like we are in a very small town and everyone works together and we want to keep it healthy. So we decided to just make sure that instead of us burning things here, so we just recycle it and it goes for window for sorting. Okay. Yeah. One of the main uh, projects that the city of Ventuk is working on at the moment in terms of reducing um, pollution from vehicles is um, implementing our sustainable urban transport master plan. We call it the SUTMP in short. Um, <clears throat> the city of Ventuk is actually really in the process of doing a lot. Uh, with, in terms of the transport units, they are um, moving towards improving our public transport infrastructure. Uh, electricity is trying to move towards ways in which we can save energy. Water is trying to come up with initiatives in, in terms of how we can um, <clears throat> also uh, better respond to water problems that may arise in the city of Ventuk, um, smart meters and uh, um, services in which we can detect leaks um, on time and so forth. So there are a lot of projects that are running at the moment. Currently, it's not safe because of lack of infrastructure, infrastructures. Mm -hmm. But in the future, the city is moving into a modern system. We're looking at providing uh, NMT, non-motorized tra transport infrastructures. That includes now the cycling lanes and the, and the pedestrian sidewalks. Yeah. And that means it will be safe for everyone. So the SUTMP has its core focus, the non-motorized transport. Non-motorized includes all forms of transport which um, do not um, <clears throat> need to use a vehicle, so nothing motorized. So we are talking about walking and cycling mainly at the focus of that, of which now the city is trying to implement infrastructure um, to encourage more walking and cycling from the people and take off the load um, from, the, from, from the roads. So basically, uh, instead of us like on consuming um, fuel and other things that to make our, our environment dirty, we decided to come up with e-bike um, projects so that we use them like to go around town and when tourists come here as well, they use the e-bikes. It's actually, it's electrical um, bike. So what happened, it has a motor. So this motor, like once it's fully charged, so it, um, it actually boosts you when you're doing, so you, you, it actually like you, it pushes you. Yeah, so you do recycle, but then they, it has like a motor, like, and it can go like um, probably 35 kilometers per hour, so it's quite fast. It's quite fast. Yeah. It includes an electric motor and a battery. And in this case, the battery is beneath the box. So we, we, we do deliveries in Ventuk mm -hmm. with green mobility, 100% carbon neutral. Yes. Um, which means the battery needs to be recharged. It's recharged by solar, um, and it has a range of about 50 kilometers before you have to do the recharging. Mm -hmm. But that is the, the essentials of any electric bicycle. Wow. It's like pushing me, guys. Woo, I feel the velocity, the momentum, the momentum. We will start implementing this very soon with the two universities of NAST and UNAM, so to provide them with electric bikes. And I personally believe the more bikes you have on the road, the more awareness you create, and the more people will actually be keen to swap, to change their mindsets. Other land users include examples from tourist sectors. We hear more and more talks about eco-friendly tourism, but what does that mean? We work with the Ministry of Environment and Tourism um, to promote, to create awareness with, um, on environmental sustainability. Sustainable land use is considering the resources that we currently have 
and taking care of them so that it's that we can use it for a longer period of time, but not just for my generation, but your generation and our children's generation and further on. Conservation of biodiversity, mm -hmm. making sure that all life forms are protected and uh, the sustainable utilization or use of natural resources. So that is, if you conserve, you get much life or you get them in abundance, then you can use them. So the result of good conservation will have to be enjoyed. We, as the Namibia Tourism Board, we do routine inspections on our establishments, the registered businesses. And uh, when we go out to, during our routine inspections, we usually encourage lodge owners to adopt these measures. Um, we talk a lot uh, about, uh, with them with regards to sus sustainability. We also require for new lodges to have an environmental impact assessment being done before um, establishing a lodge. We want to continue being able to be here at this place, for example, and make sure that it's for many years to come. So there, the, the local communities around the area, the impact on the park, the, 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 the natural, the animals in the natural surrounding, that should be taken care of in that setting. So um, to, to um, prevent over tourism in the park, one would look at various strategies to have in place, like for example, different entrance points, yeah. um, different um, in, um, hours for entry, just to, to, to minimize the, the tourism flow into the park and to still keep that natural setting as is. Mining-based tourism, yes. That is more on uh, leaving the presence of, or the visibility of, of, of mining having been taking place in the area. Some land in Namibia is used for mining. And while mining is traditionally seen as damaging the environment, mines nowadays make a huge effort towards having a positive footprint on the environment. So what the Chamber does is we are a, um, an organisation that represents the, the interests of the industry. But more importantly, what we do is we ensure that the environment for the industry is, is attractive um, and is balanced. Um, and how we do that, primarily what we do is we um, engage with government on behalf of the industry to ensure that there's, that there's to advocate actually for a, um, a policy and regulatory environment that, is, um, that ensures optimal returns for the shareholder. Now the shareholder is the person that actually makes the investment to develop the re resource. Basically the idea or the recommendation and mandate by government is that we need to um, restore the area that we mine into as closely as possible, if not as to how we found it, inclusive of landscaping as well as revegetating the areas, basically. Currently we are doing very well in terms of our regulations. Our regulations in place are in order. Uh, in terms of ensuring that our clients get the right documents before they conduct any activity. We've always had um, strong uh, uh, um, environmental considerations here at Namdim as we carry out um, our activities. Um, I think one thing of note is the fact that the Environmental Management Act um, came in a little bit later and um, so all the requirements and regulations that came in with the Act um, came in while NAMDA was already in existence. However, prior to the, um, pre, uh, to the um, legislature being gazetted, we did have um, a conscious um, environmental uh, um, persona to, to the company, yes. Most of the mining in our, in our for our Spina mine, we are an underground mine. <clears throat> so on the surface, we don't actually have that much of an impact if you look at the bigger picture of, of all of our mining activities. Um, the one thing that might be happening is the increasing size of the tailings dam, which I said is where we pump away some of our waste rock. Before we had, you know, there were challenges of disposal of waste, waste toxic waste products. 
Now new technology has made that um, where you can treat the waste product so that it is no longer harmful when you dispose of it to, to the natural environment. And what we usually do is during the EIA phase or the exploration phase, sorry, we conduct um, environmental impact assessments just to understand what are the environmental sensitivities of the area, um, inclusive of checking whether there's any red listed species um, and if there are or any endangered vegetation basically. Um, then we also need to take into consideration the landscape of the area. Um, so all of that is taken note of. We look at how the environment is prior to mining. How does it look like? and then make note of it and which then allows us to understand how we should uh, leave the area. What is very different today as compared to 20 years ago is just um, the way that the industry operates and the importance that it is placed on doing things responsibly and you see that in the laws and regulations which ensure that you know, your companies look after the environment, that there's minimal impact on the, on the surrounding environment. Um, and in our laws and regulations, that means that the companies have to do environmental impact assessments and they have to produce environmental management plans, which, um, in, which basically put out how they're going to mitigate their impact on the environment. For us now, mines and energy, to allow you to conduct that activity, you must be in a position of an environmental clearance certificate. Yes, we make sure that without that, unfortunately, we cannot allow you. Namibia has actually got one of the best environmental laws in place, which is known as the Environmental Management Act of 2007. Now, what this law does and how it works quite simply is that before a mining operation can actually begin to, to mine the mineral or to extract the mineral is that they have to apply um, or they have to conduct environmental impact assessments for which they used to apply for a, a, an environmental clearance certificate through the Ministry of Environment. Um, if they deem it to be um, of minimal impact or manageable, then they will issue the environmental clearance certificate. Um, so something that we've done uh, or that we're starting to do in the future, in the near future, <clears throat> is to actually, uh, I, they, they call it paste fill, for those of you that are going to be going into mining, these are the type of terms that you will get um, acquainted with. So paste fill, it means we're going to be pumping back these rocks and material that we've taken out from underground and we put it back underground um, into open uh, casts and backfilling. Um, the open holes that we have and this will mean that the size of our tailings dam on the surface will be less, will be smaller um, and in effect we will, um, our e environmental footprint will be smaller. Um, so during active mining um, or mining phase um, we do concurrent rehab so we rehabilitate as we're doing our activities as we're mining and then um, so in that time frame, sorry, prior to actually active mining, especially if there's red listed species, we go in and we collect seedlings. Um, we do plant collection. So at first, we uh, started with collecting plants on the areas that are proposed to be mined um, and keep them in the greenhouse um, and hopefully now transplant them and plant them back into the environment once we've finished with the whole mining process. In clearing, that is where you are um, gathering those seedlings for you're doing your plant collection. Um, then you start storing those plants that you've collected. Um, and then we take those to a nursery over in Vintuk for germination and just so that they mature. And once they're matured, they're brought back um, to site and we keep them in the inner greenhouse. Um, in this greenhouse particularly, we have um, seedlings, uh, uh, small plants that have been transplanted into pot bags um, from our National Botanical Garden where they are kept. Um, so here we just take care of the plants before we um, eventually transplant them into the mined out phases or the slopes that have been rehabilitated already. They are, they are most vulnerable when they're young um, to different uh, phenomena in the environment. For instance, now the baboons that we have in this area, um, it's, it's, it's best to keep them 
in order for them to grow as much as possible, to have uh, longer roots, um, to establish themselves into the ground, um, so that when you transplant them, they won't be affected by um, weather, uh, uh, for instance, wind, the strong winds that we have in this area. At Sendelang Straf, I would say, the biggest success is that we have been able to successfully integrate the rehab into the mining process. So the rehabilitation is happening while the mining is happening. We're not waiting for it until the end. Um, and then there's so many things that have contributed to that. Firstly, these two lakes. So it's the mining process and the fact that we're doing backfilling while we're mining. And then it's the environmental part where we've now come through so many years of studying this area and trying different methods to replant the plants that we now have something that seems to actually be working. So we're excited about that. Um, if we look at how we've previously done it, I mean, um, the previous environmental officers have tried circular ways of planting the plants in circles and then irrigating it like that. That didn't work. Um, we now know that this drip irrigation and having them on a slope like this is more effective to get water to the plants. So you are then actively mining and you are backfilling. So you've, you've uh, removed the soil, now you must go back in and backfill and, and retain the soil in the area and then we re start the revegetation process. So once again, our indices are ambitious. We want a greener and more sustainable Namibia. We want to reduce deforestation, increase reforestation and afforestation and develop environmentally sound agricultural practices. It is very important that as we uh, um, carry out our activities, we consider the environment. So we all need to work together towards a common goal of making sure that, you know, we are working towards the, the, the cleanliness of our city. It's various instruments um, that we'd like to put in various institutions, stakeholders, local authorities, for example, that can come together to find various uh, solutions to the problems that we are currently facing and in the future. I think we as individuals, for starters, um, it goes back to a cleaner city. Let's just, you know, love our space, mm -hmm. yeah, love our city. Um, we must stop doing things that will harm our city, yeah? Pollution, vandalism. We need to look at, strongly look at various um, innovative measures of how to combat, of course, um, climate change or the effects thereof. I would like to see how far we get um, in terms of restoring this environment. In my dream for the future is really to see that we improve now into the area of uh, monitoring now. You know, the environmental inspectors must go out there and see to it that all our stakeholders are conducting the activity according to the management plan. So once again, it's not something the government can do on its own, but something you and I can help with. We can plant our vegetables in our back garden using techniques that will save water. We can buy more locally produced products and plant more trees. Both the mining and tourist sectors have done a lot of work to better our land use and reduce their negative environmental footprint. Many projects such as community projects have started gardens to sustain themselves. And larger projects have invested in modern techniques such as hydroponic and aquaponic. You and I can also do our part. We can learn to grow vegetables or at least learn to appreciate locally grown products. So let us support our NDCs. Let us make Namobia a greener place for all. From me, Simon. And from me, Samantha. And from me, Sylvia. And from me, Tasani. It's goodbye. Can't